There's division and all kinds of chaotic mess going on throughout this world. Just as in times of old in Egypt, there was lice in the land, there was blood in the water, there was frogs in the land, there was pestilence in the land, but the children of God were kept. Amen. Amen. Because they knew the God that they served. We are kept in spite of what's going on. Amen. So I thank God for that. Amen. His saving power, his keeping power, his delivering power. And, 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 and the problem is us keeping the mindset to understand we are kept. Amen. Because a lot of times we look at the news and we listen to our friends talking and we look at our bank account. And we look at everything. And we say, oh, my God, you know, uh, things are, you know, it's Armageddon today. It's not. God is still on the throne. Amen. So we are in a, you know, if you're here for the first time, you know, we thank God that you came to fellowship with us and we pray that you enjoy the message. If you don't enjoy the message, I pray it convicts you. <laughs> Amen. I pray that it at least touches your heart. Yeah. Amen. I don't ever want you, you uh, not me, but you should never walk into a church and be indifferent about the word of God. You ought to be mad or glad. And if you're mad, it's because it penetrated you. Come on. So I want you to open up your Bibles with me if you would. The children can be dismissed to their class if they've not already done so. To the book of Matthew 13, and hold your place there. We are in our 10th week of a series. In, uh, um, if you don't grasp everything that's being said, you've got to go listen to 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1. Amen. You know, we are a judgmental, critical people because we judge on the basis of what we think we know without, judge, without evaluating everything. And that goes for people that are here and people that are watching as well. All right. I believe that this series is a timely message because the church needs to wake up Amen. Amen. and realize the representation, the authority that God gave to you and I. We have been living our lives far below the ability that we're supposed to. Far below the authority than we're supposed to because we've been believing the lies of the world. Compromise is settled into the churches, man. Uh, 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 worldliness is settled. When I say worldliness, I'm not talking about dress. I'm not talking about your music. I'm not talking about your jewelry. See, I came up in a, a, a very religious organization. You couldn't wear jewelry. You had to wear white shirts only. And, and uh, you had to wear suits. I don't care if it was 110 degrees outside. You had to look religious. How many people know what I'm talking about? Amen. Thank God. So I'm not talking about that kind of holiness. I'm talking about circumcision of the heart. I'm talking about where, where, where you live a holy life separated from sin uh, uh, unto God. There's too, many, there's too many believers in the body of Christ that are not doing that. You are not unholy because you listen to oldies. You're not unholy because you listen to blues. Those are two of my favorite musics. Amen, musics. <laughs> I listen to gospel, but the gospel today, is I could take it or leave it. But put the old hymns on. That's a whole different story, man. That moves my soul. All right? so the music today is, is designed to move your, move your flesh, not your soul. Amen. So anyway, let, let, let's get on with it today. Amen. The Bible says, uh, or God, God has ordained, equipped you for service. God did not ordain you just to be a mediocre believer. More importantly, he did not allow you to be birthed into this world for you to be a mediocre individual. There are so many believers that have been powered from on high with authority that are living the same life as, uh, as Melchizedek. 969 years and then he died. You might not live 969 years. You might live 69, 79, 89, 59, 49. But what was the value of your life? What impact did you have when you was here? See, we are put on this earth to make an impact. To make an impact first and foremost with your family. Yeah. Amen. To be a man of God, a woman of God that your children want to follow. Without you coercing them. Right? right? Then to make an impact to the Samaria and Judea, and then to the uttermost parts of the earth. So we're designed by God to be influencers. I'm going to ask you this morning, who are you influencing? Not by your verbiage, but by your lifestyle, by how you live your life, how you respond to situations and circumstances. People look at that guy, I want that. I want, that. I want what that person has. 
you know, I heard a, a man, an evangelist, Skippy Cordova, preaching. And I, I didn't, at that point, I hadn't even met him, but I heard him preaching. There was something about him. I had to have what he wanted. And my prayer is, God, if you're real, I want that, what that man's got. All right? And I sought it, and I sought it, and I sought it. And God empowered me because he's no respecter of persons. Amen. You are empowered to prosper. You are empowered to be an influencer. And the reason why you're not is because you gave up. You settled. He empowered you to be a force to be reckoned with. Let me share that. Why do you keep giving up? Why do you quit? Why do you accept a closed door as God closed that door? Your spirit knows whether God closed that door, but you pacified yourself because you don't have a spirit of resistance to, come, uh, 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 to push back against the closed doors and what the enemy's doing to you. So you just accept everything as the will of God. I've got people in here that are ex-felons. Imagine that. That are working in positions where ex-felons are not allowed. Because they did not allow that title to hold them back. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because they've been born again. Because they've been, because they've been renewed. They've been refreshed. God gave them a new mind. So they were not identifying with that old lifestyle and saying that old lifestyle forbids me from going any further. It, doesn't just, it isn't just with felons. It's with alcoholics. It's with drug addicts. It's with people that have been abused. You, you, got, you got this stigmatization in your mind that this is, my, this is my station in life. This is as far as I can go. You can go as far as you can imagine according to what God's word says. Amen. We're, empo we're empowered to live that kind of life. But we settle for just a mediocre life. I don't want a mediocre life. I want a blessed life. I want an abundant life. I want a full life. I want a life that's so full I want to complain sometimes that I'm too busy. <laughs> How many know what I'm talking about? You know, God bless you. God, oh my God, I'm too busy. I, you know what? I'd rather be too busy working for God than be no bu not busy sitting in a prison cell. <laughs> Amen. God's design and desire is for you to represent his kingdom with authority. We have too many sickly, nandy, pandy, whiny Christians today. See, I like Nicky Cruz when he first got saved. Amen. Nicky Cruz was a gangbanger back in the 50s in New York. All right. Uh, Puerto Rican gangbanger. And he, uh, uh, he got saved under Dave Wilkerson's ministry. And his first convert, he beat him up to make him get saved. <laughs> you don't want to hear me about, no, and he repented afterwards. But, you know, but, but, you know he wasn't confined to what the rest of the uh, Christian world was saying how he had to act. It was a process. It was a growth process for him. But, you know, it was just like, yeah, I, I can understand. I can appreciate that kind of guy. Because how many know Wally Cox? Okay, Pee Wee Herman. How many Pee Wee Herman Christians do we know? Do you think that your 15, 16, 17-year-old son or daughter wants a Pee Wee Herman example? We're living in a world that is full of wolves that want to destroy you as a believer, and we've been taking the low road. Sure, the Bible says if somebody spites you on one side of the cheeks, uh, I turn the other, but it doesn't mean you be a coward and you run. It doesn't mean when they tell you to do a certain thing and it's against the principles of God, you do it anyway for the sake of peace. And that's what's happening to believers today. We're not standing firm and fast and you become nothing but the world door, uh, doormat for them to wipe your feet on. The only thing the world understands is peace, is power. And the ultimate power of God is rested within us. And we succumb and we give in to everything. I don't accept what's happening in my life. And I'm empowered to change it. You're empowered to change it. Why do you keep living a defeated lifestyle? Do you think your neighbors, your friends, your relatives want to serve the God that you serve when you're defeated, disgusted, and discouraged and broke all the time? Where is the hope for them? I'm not talking against somebody that, 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 that's struggling. I'm talking about Christians who have been saved 10, 15, 20 years, and there have been no exampleship in their life. Paul told Timothy, I want you to be an example in word, deed, conduct, purity, and the truth. He said, let your, life, let your life show God's power in it. So how do we show God's power? I don't give in to the circumstances that are around me. I don't fall apart because gas prices are $10 a gallon. I don't fall apart because there's no toilet paper. I don't fear because the world's going crazy. I trust that my God is able. My God is able. So I'm not living to this world standard. 
I may be in this world, but I'm in this world. You're in this world so that we can be a hope and an example. God will provide when we repeat what he says rather than what Channel 7 News says. See, we are so connected to the worldly news broadcasting system more than we are to God's system. We repeat what they say more than what God says. So many believers feel inadequate to the call of God. I want to share something with you. It does not matter where you came from. You may have came from the lowest of lows and the worst of worst. Do not ever feel inadequate. Do not ever feel insecure and threatened or intimidated. Listen, this has got to blow your mind. I don't know how we don't get excited about this. The God of this universe that created everything decided to take up residence within you. Now, his authority is within us. And we allow somebody because of their superiority and inferior, inferior complex come by and make us feel like a nothing. I don't care if you're 25 years old and you got eight kids. You are somebody. According to the world, they're going to shame you. According to the world, they're going to want to disgrace you. I refuse to put my head down in shame or embarrassment about anybody to anything. Refuse. Not in defiance, but in confidence. That I am, I'm not going to be subject or bound to what I came from or subject or bound to what you think I am. You are somebody. I don't, that is so difficult for us to maintain in our spirit on a regular basis. We can get out on a Sunday morning, but what about Monday when the attacks come? What about Tuesday when they're increased? What about Wednesday when they increase even more? All of a sudden we start to forget it. You got to go through the fire and understand you are somebody. I am. And you need to say, I am a child of the living God. We are a force to be reckoned with. Amen. We're not some nandy pandy people. Amen. I can't see nandy pandy people uh, 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 pulling down the walls of Jericho. I can't see nandy pandy people taking all the riches of Egypt. I can't see all the nandy pandy people doing the great healing revivals. We only got nandy, nandy pandy people today because we're hypersensitive. I can't preach this because this church is going to be offended. This half is going to be okay. I'll offend everybody in here with the word of God. I didn't say it with my words. I said the word of God. Amen. I'm not preaching a message to make you like me. Stop surrendering your call to your insecurities. You are called to be a powerhouse. You are a da David. You're not a Goliath. You're a true soldier of Jesus Christ. I've, I've heard that time my walk with God, God, my entire walk with God. I'm a soldier of Jesus Christ. I would not want to go to warfare, war with some of the people that came to be a soldier for Jesus. Amen. They can't withstand the little trials of life. I lost my job and they fall apart and they doubt God. See, a soldier does not doubt the authority that's above them. They respond to commands. A good soldier. We respond to commands. We don't doubt the authority that he's given us. We don't doubt the position. It may look like we're on shaky ground, but we win. Hallelujah. We win. Look at all the times you thought you were going to lose before, and you did, you did not lose. Stop surrendering your authority. You are not who you used to be. You, it has now come to your attention what you should be. Take a back seat to no one. Amen. The Bible says he made you the head and not the tail. Amen. Take a back seat to no one. I'm not talking again. I'm not talking about being, being, being pompous and arrogant. I'm talking about being bold and confident. There is a big difference. There's not enough boldness and not enough confidence in the body of Christ today. We're so insecure and so afraid of everything that's on, going on around us. God has a purpose for you. Amen. It's a shame to live our life and die and never find our purpose. Graveyards are full of people that have died and never found their purpose. And it is never too late to step into your purpose. You can be 60, 70, 80 years of age. It's never too late to step into that purpose. Purpose is waiting for you to wake up and realize it and step into it. Yeah. It's never too old for you to be an influencer. Yeah. You'll be, be on the last stage of life. You may have more life behind you than in front of you, but you could still be an influencer. Right. Yeah. Amen. You could still turn, turn it around. In order for us to represent the kingdom of God, we need to wake up and exhibit some of the same characters that Jesus exhibited. And one of them was uh, a confidence, but it was also something called aggressive, aggressiveness. Yes. We have, I'm going to read it again. I've read it for the last two weeks, kept trying to get there. Uh, 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 we have a negative uh, uh, understanding of aggressiveness. Uh -huh. Amen. And I, I've heard this my entire walk with God as a young preacher. And usually it's 
uh, preachers that are hypersensitive that tell me this. Well, you know, brother, you're too aggressive when you preach. You intimidate people when you preach. I want to intimidate the devil. I'm not being intentionally aggressive. They have a negative uh, 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 understanding of aggressiveness, so they tone down their anointing so as to not offend. Jesus never toned down his anointing so as not to offend. He was aggressive, but there is a negative and there's a positive aspect to aggressiveness. We as believers are supposed to be positively aggressive. All right, and this is, the, this is the negative, and of course we all know this. Behaving in an angry, violent manner. Have I behaved in an angry, violent manner? Up here, today? Amen. But you play this message for some preachers that don't believe in being aggressive. They say, oh no, you just sound hostile, you sound mad. No, here's what I'm being. Assertive. Why am I being assertive? Because I believe in the product that I have. You see, when you, when, you, when you come across a salesman, he's trying to sell you something. He's a good salesman only if he believes in the product. That's right. That's right. If he don't believe in the product, he cannot sell it to you. He'll be a hungry salesman. I believe in salvation. I believe in deliverance in Jesus' name. I believe in the power of the Holy Ghost. I believe in heaven. I believe in the gifts of the Spirit. I believe that God has a call. Therefore, I am a, 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 a assertive in what I'm saying. I'm as assertive here as I am when I'm singularly talking to somebody. I'm assertive because I believe in the product. Yes, yes. Bold. Yes. Bold doesn't mean loud. Come on, come on. Energetic. Yes. <laughs> God, if there's anything the body of Christ needs is a shot of adrenaline. Yes. We need a shot of adrenaline because we only get excited when the third song comes on. Come on. Did you come in here energetic? Did you come in here dancing with some pep in your step, ready to receive what God had for you? That's where we're supposed to be, energetic. And not just in church, energized wherever you're at, whatever you're doing. My God, some of us act like, well, Sister Lily, 90-something years old, have more energy than half the believers I know. She's 97. Right? Hey Amen, I got that right this time. <laughs> more energy than half the believers I know. I just got to take a nap and get refreshed. Refreshed from what would you do? Full of enterprise. Yes. Amen. Yes. This door closes, okay, but you know what? With God's help, I can, I can do it this way. Right. Don't ever believe that old lie. Well, when God closes the door, he opens a window. No, he closed the door. That's right. And he'll open up another door. You're not, like, you're not some burglar going to climb in a window. Right. <laughs> Initiative and action. We are supposed to be full of action. Period. Mark chapter 13. Society and the religious institution make you doubt yourself by questioning who do you think you are. When I first got saved, God got a hold of me and I started going to um, uh, Santa Rita Teen Challenge. I wasn't preaching. I didn't know nothing. All I knew was what God done for me. I was testifying. And I had people come up to me and say, who do you think you are? You know what that did to me? Yes. You're right. Yes. Who do I think I am? For a quick second. Until somebody got a hold of me and said, Brother, don't hang your head in shame. Amen. God opened up that door for you. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who they think you are. It's what matters is who you think you are. Yes. And there's too many of us, and I want to say this again, are bound to your thinking from where you came from. Uh-huh. I am so far separated from where I came from, mentally that you can't use it against me. Amen. You trying to use it against me is like trying to burglarize the house I used to live at. I don't live there no more. <laughs> you can't do me no harm because I don't live there no more. How many follow what I'm talking about? You see, on the outside, you may see one thing. I went to go get a, a car wash yesterday, and this guy says, oh, you're an old Vato Loco? I go, no, I'm not. I said, no, I'm not. I says, I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. And he goes, oh, well, it's just, you're, you're, you're. I said, it doesn't matter what you see. I'm telling you who I am. I refuse to allow that man. He goes, well, you look just like my brother, you, you know, and, and you got his movement. He said, I don't care. I'm not going to identify and allow you to put me back in that box. But hap- what happens when somebody tells you, oh, I remember when we had to pick you up out of the gutter. Spirit of shame is going to come on you for a hot minute. 
And if you don't watch it, it's going to stay a hold on you. We need to separate and divide ourselves from where we came from and who we used to be to who we are. Here's what God said. He says, I've taken everything of who you were and I put it in the deepest part of the ocean. And, 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 you know, and one preacher said he put up a no fishing sign. But we go back, we allow everybody to go back there and pull up all the ne negative stuff about us and show us on a regular basis. Man, you can stay from here to Tuesday and tell me all this stuff and it ain't going to hold me. I'm a Teflon man when it comes to my past sins. It don't stick. It shouldn't stick. If you don't like what it's doing to you, stop wearing it. I don't like what people tell me how I feel when they try to bring up my past. I don't wear it. That's your problem, not mine. I don't live there no more. I moved on. Obviously, they haven't. And I'm talking to even some of your Christian friends that can't let the past go. Amen. Matthew chapter 13. Let's read. Who do you think you are? You ain't got enough time for me to tell you who I think I am. Amen. When Jesus finished these parables, these comparisons, he left there. And coming to his own country, Nazareth, he taught in their synagogue, so they were amazed with bewildered wonder and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Is this not the carpenter's son? Is this not, is not his mother Mary? I mean, this is a common man. We know him. Where did he get this authority from? Are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And do not all his sisters live here among us? Where did this man get this? What makes you think you got authority? You come from the family you come from. They watch you through your addiction. They watch you through your alcoholism. They watch you through, through, through your beatings and your divorces and your breaking, uh, 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 breaking your life apart. And, the, and now you're going to walk around and tell them you got hope. Who do you think you are? Amen. See, I have a brother that was 15 months older than me. He was super cool in his own eyes. In seventh grade, he wrote, I'm your God, and it's your book. And he was so self-righteous against me. Because in the seventh grade, he got a job, and he held that job, to, that same job, till he became the plant manager. Never had a different job. And bragging about how much money he made. Now, we're talking about the 1960s. He'd bring home a $30 check. I'd pull out 50 I made that day. See, but here's what happened. That 50 cost me months and years. His $30 kept him free. So because of his standing, he was always looking down on me and talking against me because I didn't have enough sense to do things the right way. So now I get saved. Well, who do you think you are going to try and test, tell me something? I've been good my whole life. You got those kind of family members? They've been good their whole life? They look down on you? Well, the script flipped. In his old age, he ended up going to jail for the same things I used to do. Now he had to look at me on the same playing field. Whether the script flips or not, we're all on the same playing field. Don't allow somebody else's judgment against you. Jesus did not allow their opinion to, make, to feel him disqualified, and he still spoke with authority. And they took offense... People are going to take, be offended because you don't have the degree. People are going to be offended because you didn't go through the course. People are going to be offended because you don't belong to this big organization. Or who do you think you are? Who's behind you? Heaven. Yes. Who's behind you? God. Yes. By what authority are you doing this? I'll tell you by what authority I'm doing this. It is God who called you. They took offense because he did not meet their standards. You're not going to meet people's standards, my friend. You got to be assured and confident in God that He called you, He ordained you, and not give it. Well, you know, by what authority are you preaching? Uh, where'd you go to Bible school? Uh, you have no authority to. Uh, here's what my Bible says No man can receive anything except God give it to him. So you don't like where I'm at, talk to God. Because those little things keep us bound and stop us from progressing in life. They were, they were repelled and hindered, and hindered from acknowledging his authority and caused to stumble. They couldn't accept it. And Jesus said to them, and here it is, our prophet is not without honor where? Except his own home.
It took well over 20 years for my family to respond to Christ in me. But I was able to impact and touch the lives of everybody else. But you keep plugging away and you keep doing it. Eventually, they will see God in you. They need to see persistence. They need to see, see stability. And they need to see consistency. Galatians chapter 1. Hallelujah. By what authority are you doing this? Do not doubt. They say these things to make you doubt who you are. And if you doubt who you are, there's hesitation. Hesitation is a deterrent and a detriment to your, to your, to your walk in God. You know, when they're doing a, a relay race or any kind of race, right, when you're running, one of the worst things you could do is look back to see how far ahead you are. You lose a tenth of a second, and a tenth of a second can make the difference between winning and losing. Keep going forward, keep looking forward. Galatians chapter 1, verse 11, let's read. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul was somebody. Amen. He was uh, uh, taught at the seat of Gamaliel. He was a Roman. He was a, a, a Jew. He was, uh, had authority within the, within the uh, Jewish synagogue. But he had no authority with the Christians. He had no authority with what they called the way. He had no authority with the disciples. Matter of fact, when he got saved, he went into the desert for two years. And then came back with power and authority from God. They didn't believe him. They didn't accept him. They held him at arm's distance. And he had to throw down his credentials and tell them where he got his authority. Because even then, the early church was starting off with titles and degrees. Amen. If you're not this person, you're not that person, you're nobody. He says, he comes and he tells them where he got his authority from. He says, for I want you to know, no brethren, that the gospel which was proclaimed and made known unto me is not a man's gospel. He says, I didn't go to Bible school. He says, I was binding my business going down Damascus Road. I was binding my business driving down East 14th and the Holy Ghost got a hold of me. Amen. Amen. <laughs> you're minding your business at some park and the Holy Ghost got a hold of you. With a human invention according or pattern after any human standard. For indeed, I did not receive it from man, nor was I taught it from man. He says, so if you're looking for a degree, or if you're looking for something to satisfy you, you're not going to get it from me. But it came to me through who? A direct what? Direct revelation from God. Listen to me, direct revelation is not just for the five-fold ministry. Direct revelation is for anybody who calls upon the Lord. He'll give you that revelation. He'll give you understanding. He'll empower you to do what he told you to do. We are so stuck on degrees and titles. Titles are destructive. I don't know about you, but I've seen people that I thought were good men, good women, and they were until they got that title. You ever meet them in the church and all of a sudden their head bigger than their, their anointing? And it came back through a revelation given to me by Jesus Christ the Messiah. He said, I got it from above. So what's your excuse? Why do you keep excusing your behavior? Now, don't misquote me. If you're rude and crude, <laughs> you need to excuse your behavior. But I'm talking about if you're doing everything you should be doing in the Lord, and you're just ministering the gospel, and you're living a life of exampleship, and somebody with a little bit more authority, somebody with a little title, come to you and they try to make you feel insecure or inferior or you got to go to them to get approval or understanding. Why am I going to go to you when I can go to the master? Yeah. Why am I going to you? When, you know, I mean, I will come to you. Uh -huh. I've always gone to my, to, to, to my elders. I've always gone to them. But I went to the master first. And then when I went to them, he, they only confirmed yeah. what he told me in the first place. Yeah. See, we got it wrong. We go, we go to the man of God to get approval first. Now, how many here know when you talk to me, what's the first thing I say? I can't hear you. What did they say? <laughs> I want you to come. Don't come in. Well, pastor, what should I, what did God say? <laughs> Amen. Amen. If God said it, I'm for it. Authority and boldness comes from God alone. You cannot manufacture it. You cannot manufacture your boldness. You cannot manufacture your authority. And the devil knows when somebody has authority. You're trying to attack the works of the enemy and you don't have the authority. That's why he's not letting hold loose of your family, your mind, or the people around you, your finances. He's not letting loose of them because he knows you have no authority. 
the seven sons of Sceva spoke, and they said, we adjure you in Jesus' name, whom Paul preaches, to come out of that man. And the demon says, I know Paul. I know Jesus. They got authority. But who are you? Who are you? You may be spitting scripture, but who are you? You don't know the authority behind the scripture. So the devil knows whether you have authority or not. You see, it's not important if your neighbor knows you have it. It's only important that the enemy of your soul knows that you have it. If he knows that you have it, he cannot hold you back. He'll lie to you, he'll deceive you, he'll try to trick you, but when you know your authority, you don't accept it. Amen. Turn your Bibles to, to uh, um, John chapter 7. Hallelujah. Do not surrender your authority or your boldness or your confidence to nobody. You are somebody. Amen. Glory, to God. Glory to God. Therefore the Jews kept looking for him at the feast, asking, where can he be? Where is that fellow? And there was the mass of people, much whispered, discussing and, and, and hot disputing about him. Some were saying he is a good man. Others are saying, no, he misleads and deceives the people, gives them false ideas. He's telling them they're sons of God. He's telling them that God is love. He's not holding them in condemnation. He's not holding them according to the law and the dictates of the law. They didn't like that. That same division in the churches today. There are so many organizations that want, to, want you to be upheld by the law, the do's and the don'ts. They want to be dictated by the, the kind of people they allow to come into the churches. They were dictated by the kind of people they allowed to go into the synagogue. Unclean people could not come in to the synagogues. And they were saying he is spreading hearsay among the people. He's allowing just anybody willy-nilly to come into the church. Some people agreed with it, some people didn't. Just like today. Some people believe in open borders in the church. Some don't. So how do they keep them out? They have the best looking people sitting in the front of the church. At the door. Making you feel welcome or unwelcome when you come into the church. We're supposed to be a house of love. A house of acceptance. Regardless of what you look like, what you smell like. Yeah. You know, I have a friend of mine years ago, and uh, uh, he drinks a lot. And he had told me, he says, uh, uh, he actually saved my life one time. I was, I was choking to death. The room was spinning. I was going black. He gave me the Heimlich. Remember, remember that? He gave me the Heimlich. And he spit it out. I was going out. And, and uh, you know, he kept seeing me. He said, man, I'm going to come to your church. I'm gonna come. But I drink. And, you know, I don't go nowhere without my alcohol. I said, so what? Amen. Just come respectful. Yeah, right. He hasn't made it here yet. But he knew there was a place he can come to. Amen. See, most people don't know there's a place they can go to like that. That's right. So they're kept out. And what Jesus was doing, he was coming and he was saying, you know, uh, 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 when the angel of the Lord appeared when Jesus was born, the angel of the Lord made a decree. He said, uh, a, peace and on good, a peace and goodwill on earth towards man. What he was saying is God's making peace with man. But there's some people that don't want to believe this message and still want to hold you up to the law. Touch not, taste not, handle not. Amen. You get to heaven by your merits. You ain't getting to heaven by your merits. You're getting to heaven by grace. Amen. Some people that don't like people like you and I are going to turn around and be shocked. Listen to me. There ain't going to be no slum in heaven. Amen. There's going to be no black side, no brown side, no white side, no yellow. No. I pray to God that I live next to my biggest enemy. Amen. I can see me right now every morning. Open up my windows. Hey! <laughs> I made it. <laughs> but no one dared speak out boldly about him. That's how your critics are. They will not speak out boldly against you. They will go behind your back. And that's the, that, that is the worst deception that there is. Because when you do hear it, you hear it from a good friend of yours that has no business telling you what somebody else said. Well, tell me something. First of all, why are they comfortable telling you that? And why do you feel it's necessary to tell me that? Now I'm questioning who I am. I'm questioning my fears and insecurities rising up. And it's hard. I'm already struggling to deal with it. I keep pushing them down and they keep coming. Listen to me. I'm not saying it's going to be easy to overcome your fears and insecurities. Amen. 
Man, I've been stomping mine down for over 20 years. 30 years I've been stomping mine down. And when I wake up in the morning, they're, hey. I just cast you down. Yeah, well, yeah, well, we're here again. It's an everyday struggle, but as long as I keep my mind stayed on him. Amen. Purveyors of trouble, they come to you and they tell you something that somebody else said because they speak in the shadows about you. You know what it is? It ain't nothing but pure jealousy. Crabs don't like to let other crabs get out of the pot. Amen. You go to San Francisco Fisherman's Wharf, and I don't know about now, but before you walk there and you see all the crab pots there, and you see the crabs pulling each other down. First time I saw that, you stupid, you're going in the pot. I'd be living 10 years on the bottom. <laughs> I'd be the one pushing people up. <laughs> Amen. But no one dares speak out boldly about him for fear of the leaders of the Jews. God will always give you a remnant of people that believe in you that will protect you. Amen. Amen. You don't need to protect yourself. God will put people in your life that will protect your reputation. Amen. You see, we got to start learning what it means to have authority. Authority means I don't need to uh, 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 justify or excuse myself. Amen. I don't need to justify why, we're, we, why we are where we are at and why we are going where we're going. God is directing us. We walk in that authority. We walk in that boldness because it came from on high. It didn't come from below. It didn't come from anybody else. We need to learn how to be aggressive. Even if they don't like your method. <laughs> You're not understanding this. They may not like your method. Be Now, what is aggressive again? Assertive. Bold. Confident. What is it? energetic. Amen. When people come against you because of your aggressiveness, they want to rob you of all those things. They want to put you in a box. Amen. They want you to conform to their idea of what they think a Christian or a preacher should be. I've had it my entire Christian walk since I've been, uh, since I've been a preacher. People want to put me in their box. I was even taught that way. When you get in the pulpit, my God, you stand here and you stand, you stand straight and you don't take more than two steps away from the pulpit and you come back and you don't go, uh, 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 and you don't stutter. Oh, I blew it right there. <laughs> you know, you, you, you don't, you, you, your inflection should only be so high. And, and I, I've been trained like that. But I got sick and tired of being in somebody's box because that was not me. You see, here's the thing. Let me share something with you, saints. I was uh, so afraid of becoming a Christian because I didn't want God to make me something I wasn't. I was afraid he was going to make me a Pee Wee Herman, and I'd never been a Pee Wee Herman my entire life. I didn't want that to happen. But what happened was worse than that. They took my authority from God away from me and conformed me into the image of every other preacher. Hello? Yes. Refused to get in a box. God does not want to take your character away from you or your identity. He, wants to, or, or he does want to take your identity, but he wants to refine you. That's what God did with me. He refined me. Amen. Stop allowing them. Listen, you like to tell jokes? God's okay with that. He just wants to clean your dirty jokes up. Amen. You're a humorous individual? That's okay. All right, we're so afraid to surrender because God's going to change. No, he's going to clean you up. You're going to trust me. You're going to like what he's going to do to you. Yeah. Amen. You're going to, he's going to, you see, I allowed the church to conform me. They took all this off and put Tobias suits on me. Yeah. I didn't like it after 10 years. Who am I? No more car shows, no more dominoes, no more basketball games, no more football games. Just praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. I'm going to God, heaven in a gospel train. But in the meantime, I'm living here yes. on this earth that God created for me to enjoy. But I'm not enjoying it because I'm being conformed into the image of religion. Do you think your child wants to get saved? Your family wants to get saved? Be conformed into somebody's image of what they think they're supposed to look like? No, there is freedom in Christ. I don't do things, I don't, I don't do things because I can't do them. I do them because it's not admittatious for me. I can still smoke dope if I want to. That's right. Don't look at me like that. You can too. Some of you still are. <laughs> Amen. I don't do it because I don't need it. 
He delivered me from the things that were destroying me and set me free for the things that are keeping me, that are strengthening me, that are empowering me. We need to be aggressive even if they don't like your box or your platform or the way that you project it. My preaching isn't for everybody. Amen. Somebody, oh no, I just don't like that. I, I just want somebody who's going to be nice and tell me good things about me. I don't, I don't like him. I don't like the way he looks. I don't like the way he acts. A little arrogant, little sucker. Who's he think he is? I'll tell you who I am. <laughs> you see, I can't preach like Joel Osteen because that's, I'm not Joel Osteen. I can't preach like Oral Roberts because I'm not Oral Roberts. I can't preach like the way I was taught. I have to preach the way the Holy Ghost gives it to me. Amen. We are too set on trying to replicate what we think we see and what we think we know instead of being you. Now, don't get me wrong. I, you know, if I was to walk around, hey, amen. thank you, Jesus. Put me in check. Amen. Because my lifestyle should typify something different. I don't need to identify with a thug to, to, to win them for Christ. Because they're never going to want what I got if I still look and, and, and talk and act and live in the same manner that they do. We got to present something better. You don't present something better by your clothing. You don't present something better by your, by your speech. You could present something better by your exampleship. Amen. The greatest uh, uh, example of that is I remember when, when, when Charlie was much younger, uh, uh, we were going down the freeway on our bikes and I lost a saddlebag. And I didn't know it until afterwards, but he watched me intently to see how I was going to handle that. You know, a saddlebag was not cheap, and those were custom saddlebags on top of that. And I didn't even bust a sweat. My exampleship won him over a little bit more. Yeah. I didn't, oh my God, what am I going to do now? It was, not, it was, that's what you got insurance for. That's right. How am I talking about? <laughs> We sweat, th we sweat things because we're, we, we sweat things because we're, 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 we're too ignorant to spend pennies to save dollars. Yeah. I can't afford to get insurance. And then you don't get insurance and the devil robs you and then you get mad at God. And God is telling you, once you be wise, get some insurance and protect yourself. Just a little side note. First Kings chapter 22. Some people are just not going to like you. Stop trying to make everybody like you. Guess what? If you don't like me, too bad. <laughs> that's your loss, not mine. Yeah. Amen. I, really, that's your loss. Yeah. Come on. Amen. It wasn't always like that. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I was one of the greatest people pleasers, people that are insecure. Yeah. Amen. Our people please us because they want everybody, we want everybody to love us. Yeah. Yeah. I come from an unlovable family. Or they, been, they may have been loving, but they didn't give it to me. I was the stepchild of the house. So I was always looking for attention and always looking for somebody to love me, to validate me. And I compromised in so many ways to get that validation and that acceptance. So it took a real power from God for me to stand in my own and stand fast and believe him and not compromise who I am or what God's called me to do for you to like me. That's a trap that the enemy uses so that you surrender your anointing. See, the enemy, if he can't get your soul, he don't care. He'll go to the next best thing, your anointing. If he can get your anointing, you have no authority here on your earth and you are not impactful. He don't want you to go to heaven but in exchange, he'll take your anointing. So how many of us are surrendering our anointing because we change who we are just so we don't offend somebody? Now, again, don't get me wrong. If, you're, if you are offensive, you need to be concerned about that. You should not be offensive. You know, the Bible says whatever things are pure, whatever things are just, whatever things are holy, there be any virtue, if there be praise, think on those things. Right? We're supposed to be mindful. We're supposed to be considerate. But... Sometimes when somebody's trying to control you, it does not matter how mindful or considerate you are. It's never enough. That's right. Enough. They want more and more and more from you. So let's read 1 Kings chapter 22. Ahab, king of Israel, said to Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man, Micaiah, son of Imlah, 
by whom we may inquire of the Lord. Now, he was not the only prophet in the land, but all the other prophets have conformed to the king. They changed their message to the king so they didn't have to have any retribution. They changed their message to the king so he would like them and they would have favor. But there was one man who refused to change. And here's what he says about him. But I hate him because he doesn't tell me anything good about me. I don't understand all these other 125,000 prophets, whatever the amount was, they all turned and started telling me how good I am. But this one man, I don't like him. Let them not like you. Because right. here's what we find out. He inquired of him anyway. When you got the truth, even your enemies will eventually come to you. And they will respect it because you don't compromise who you are. Too many believers are surrendering their authority because they compromise who we are for the sake of somebody liking me. I'm not a masochist. I want everybody to like me. I think I'm a good guy. I think I'm a great guy. I think I'm a wonderful person. You all lost a good opportunity to say amen. Don't do it now. You lost it, man. Amen. But if they don't like me, amen. I'm not going to make you like me. Amen. I'm not going to uh, uh, change who I am to make you like me. I changed a lot, and for 10 years I didn't like myself and didn't know it until the end. I didn't like me because I couldn't be who I was. I mean, even to, you know, even to go play handball, we had to, you know, it was years later. I couldn't play in the beginning because it was unacceptable in the church. What does that have to do with my salvation? What does your music have to do with your salvation? Yes. Nothing. But for image sake, God's not concerned with your image. He's concerned with your heart. Yes. He says, I don't like him. Be true to who God called you to be. See, God called me to preach the gospel. So I'm a preacher. I'm a messenger. I'm this messenger wherever I'm at, whatever I'm doing. When I see or sense there's a need, I'm proclaiming the word. Be true to who God called you to be. Stop surrendering your anointing and be bold and be confident. Go to 2 Samuel chapter 12. Hallelujah. We've got 14 minutes. This will probably be the end of our series here. If it is, you don't want to miss in this next series. Let's read 12 7. Then Nathan said to, devil, to, to devil, David, you don't challenge the king. At this time, you didn't even go to the king's presence unless he called for you. Amen. If you walked in the king and he did not hold out his scepter to you, you were struck down dead. So the prophet had a message for the king. You ever have a message for anybody? God give you a message for somebody? And you went to go talk to them and you got intimidated and didn't tell them? Anybody? Amen. Now here's what happens. God said in his word, when I tell you to warn that wicked man of his wicked ways, and you warn not that wicked man of his wicked ways, that same wicked man will die in his ways, and his blood will I require in your hand. Yeah. I had a message I had to give to a good, good friend of mine many years ago. And it separated us for a dozen years because of the message that I gave. It was a true message. I didn't want to deliver it, but I had to be faithful to the message. God gives you a message, you have to be faithful to that message. Yeah. Whether they hate you, yeah. it doesn't matter. You may save their soul. Oh, yeah. Nathan had no business approaching the king like this except for the fact that God called him to. Mm. You may not have any business approaching your friend, your neighbor, your relatives, or so, somebody you may know with what you're doing except God called you to. And we question our authority because, well, gee, they're a person of respectability. They're a person of authority. They have, they have a degree. Who am I? If you can't respond as a child of God, then ask yourself who you are. Yes. Then Nathan said to David, you are that man. He went and exposed him. He goes, look, there's a sheep. There's, your neighbor has a sheep. You have 20 sheep. And you take that one. What should happen to that man? He says, kill him. He says, you're that man. 
You took Bathsheba as yourself, and you got all these people over here. Right. And then you had her husband killed. That's right. You're that man. Yeah. Wow. He spoke a hard message to him, and he did not compromise the message because of the authority that the king had over him. Again, I want to ask you, this is an important question. Because body ministry is not being administered properly because we're shutting up the anointing. If God gives you a message to share with somebody, and you don't share it with somebody, you are not the first person he asked for you to share it. It just fell on you because the one that was supposed to share it said no. Then David turned around and says, kill him. No, he didn't say kill him. He had to accept it because it was truth. People will not accept truth if it comes out of somebody that's nandy-pandy. He stood there with confidence, and he had told him, this is from God. Years ago, there was this brother that was, was a backslidden preacher, and the Holy Spirit had called me to go talk to him. We used to call him Thunderlungs. He preached with one lung, louder than most people with two lungs, because he lost a lung. He was living on Fifth Street in the railroad tracks, bleeding, and he called out to God for God to save him. And immediately the blood stopped coming out of his mouth and he got saved. Awesome preacher. He backslid. He started drinking again, started using again. And the Holy Spirit got a hold of me in the middle of the night, told me to go talk to him and share this message with him. And I didn't want to because this was the message. This could be your last time, bro. God's reaching out to you. He saved you miraculously the first time. If you don't come back, you may not make it back. He didn't accept that he died that night. I don't know if he reached out and asked for forgiveness before he died, but he died that night. Mm -hmm. I did not want to give it because I felt in my eyes he was superior to me. He knew more than me, so forth and so on. But it could very well have been he did repent, and I could have saved his soul. But if he didn't repent, he died in his own ways. And if I didn't say something, his blood would have been on my hand. How many follow I'm talking about? This, see, this Christian walk is serious business. And we take it just like, oh, it's just church. No, it's not church. It's a lifestyle. It's a lifestyle. The Bible says we're supposed to admonish one another in the fear of God. We're supposed to help one another in this journey and this walk. Well, it's none of my business. Yes, it is my business. Yeah? There's only one man in the, in the entire world that, that, or, 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 or one man that started that. It's none of my business. Where's your brother? Ooh, come on. Am I my brother's keeper? Come on. Not only are you requiring, you doing his death going to cause you to wander, wander, but you not taking care of your brother is going to cause you to wander. We are supposed to care one for another. But it's not happening today because we're living in a, 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 a self involuted lifestyle, a society rather. And it's not being taught or accepted in the churches. Body ministry, it, we're exempt from body ministry because we don't want to get in somebody else's business. I don't want to get in anybody else's business either, but when the Holy Spirit gets a hold of me, I'm going to aggressively get in there. I, whether it's from the pulpit or privately. How, many of you understand? I pulled you aside. Hey, come here. Yeah. The Holy Spirit said, what's stopping you from being the vessel that God wants to use? One more scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. No, I'm sorry. Go to Genesis chapter 32. This is a major one here. You need to learn how to get aggressive with God. Stop going in like a pauper. Amen. When Jesus was crucified, there was a two-inch piece of silk from the top to the bottom torn from the Holy of Holies to the Most Holy of Holies that was torn from top to bottom, signifying God tore it. So we can enter into the Holy of Holies with boldness and with confidence. You know, it's a shame to hear so many Christians praying, please, God. Please, you would think God's name is please. My children never have to come to me and ask me please. Please, can I have something to eat? You got my name, that gives you the right. Well, you know, some of you ain't got my name, you got the right to go in my refrigerator, man, so I got bad excuse. <laughs> but you got my name, you got a right. You got his name, you got a right to petition the Father. 
The reason why we say please, the reason why we beg God, because we don't know the authority and the confidence we have with God. We're looking at what we were to compare to who God is. That I don't have a right to ask. Here's what the scripture says. Command ye me, saith the Lord, concerning the works of my hands. Now we're not commanding God. We're putting him in remembrance of his word. God, you said in your word. So I'm standing before you and I'm asking you in Jesus' name, get aggressive with God. Some of us are so passive with God. He's looking at us saying, what is your problem? What do you want? My Bible doesn't say if you ask God, please, he'll give it to you. It says if you ask him in what? In faith. If you ask him in faith, asking please is not asking in faith. I know I'm going to be respectful. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying don't be respectful. But stop begging. You're not going to get something because you beg. Too many believers are beggars. Genesis chapter 32. Hallelujah. Starting at verse 24. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until daybreak. Now, theologians say that the translators were weak-willed because that word man is God. He wrestled with God. He did not wrestle with a man. Some translations say an angel. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And Jacob's thigh was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, let me go for daybreak is coming. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you declare a blessing unto me. Here's what I mean by being aggressive. Don't let go of the lifestyle God called you to walk. Don't let go of praying. Don't let go of believing until you get what you want from God. We give up way too easy. Can you imagine being saved 20, 30 years and you quit today and the rapture is tomorrow? You quit one day too short. You should have held on one more day. You should have prayed one more day. Should have held on to God one more day. We're, too, we're, we're not aggressive enough in believing the promises of God. He said in his word, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened up unto you. Hello? Anybody home? <laughs> the scripture says his ears are open to our prayers. It's not a position. It's not, prayer is not a position. Prayer is an attitude. He says that if we ask according to his will, we have what we have petitioned for. How am I, you see, so, you know, I'm going to tell you why we beg. Because our prayers are not according to the will of the Father. You're begging, you're praying and you're begging for things he said he would already give you if you just live upright. Matthew chapter 6 talks about the cares of the world and talks about the houses and all this other stuff. God said, he'll give you this if you just live upright. And you're asking for God for an increase of stuff that he already gave you an increase to if you just serve him right. Yes. Amen. So what is praying for the will of the Father? When's the last time you prayed for an increase of the body of Christ? When's the last time you prayed for souls to be saved? When's the last time you prayed for, this, for, 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 for healing to move throughout the body of Christ? When's the last time you prayed for a sound mind in your family? When's the last time you prayed for God to open up doors to have a, 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 a door of utterance? When's the last time you prayed that God be manifested in your home? When's the last time you prayed that God give you some boldness and assurance and confidence that you could stand in him? Those are the prayers of a believer. God, save my brother, save my mother, save my father. Wait a minute. He said, if you're saved, your whole household will be saved. So why am I going to utilize my prayer time asking for something he said is already going to be done? I'm supposed to pray for the harvest. I'm supposed to pray for the laborers of the harvest. Finally, one more scripture. I don't do that too often, but one more. If you don't have no boldness, you need to pray for some boldness. Because boldness is not going to just fall on you. You've got to desire it. You've got to want it. You're going to have to walk in it. Amen? I, I, Acts chapter, uh, um, I forget what's that. Acts chapter, what? 431. You ever get in a position where you don't know what to do? As, amen. I don't know what to do. I don't know what's going on. Yeah. Amen. And just pray for some boldness. Yeah. That's all you got to do. Pray God quicken you. 
And when they had prayed, they, the place in, uh, actually the verse, scripture above that, says they were threatening the disciples with harm. <laughs> Somebody got to go potty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that information. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> they were threatening them with harm. Let me share this with you. You get threatened with harm with an IRS letter? You get threatened with harm with a pink slip from your job? You get threatened from harm when all of a sudden, oh my God, I don't have enough money, what am I going to do? Those are threats. The enemy is using those things as threats to subdue you and rob you of your anointing and make you worry than have faith. He says, a believer, your faith, your standard, of, your standard, your lifestyle should be the same. It doesn't matter whether you're in the pit or on the mountaintop. Here's what you're supposed to do. Pray for boldness that you don't fear what's, what you think is happening to you. They threaten them to be beat. They already jailed some. They already killed some. So their threats were valid. But the man of God stood there and said, Lord, observe their threatenings. You see what they're saying. You see what they're doing, God. Now this is a bold prayer. This is an aggressive prayer. I'm not accepting them as the final answer. I'm not accepting their threatenings. I'm not accepting their jailing. I'm not accepting the outcome that they have. I'm looking to you, and you said all things work together for good that them love God or call according to his purpose. You said that I have an expected end, and that expected end doesn't mean being beat up or tore up by them. So I'm calling on you, God, and I want you to grant your servants, bond servants, full freedom to declare your message. I want you to give me a spirit of boldness. And you know what happens? They stood up and they preached the word of God boldly. Things are going to come your way to try to instill fear in you. They're going to threaten you. Amen. You got a little bit of money saved up and your car gets, somebody pops your tires. Going to cost you a little bit of money you have saved up to finally do something. I'm going to finally go on vacation. <laughs> it happens like that. How many know what I'm talking about? So the enemy starts threatening you. Now what are you going to do? I inspired somebody to pop your tires, robbing your money. You ain't going on vacation. I need some boldness, God. I might not be able to go to Hawaii, but I'm going to go over to the mountaintop. I'm going to declare your glory. I'm going to have the best picnic I ever had. I'm still going. I'm not giving in. I'm not surrendering to the spirit of fear and and, and loss that's troubling me. You go forward anyway. Did you learn something? Come on, give the Lord a praise. (laughs) Hallelujah. Glory to God. Bible says, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but power, love, and of a sound mind. 